welcome to the, por uh, the portion of the service uh, with a message, but I always like to go to God first, so I invite you to join me in prayer. Most loving, kind, wonderful God, Father, Son, and Spirit, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for a new year, a new beginning, a, a season of Advent that leads to the coming of Jesus. And God, as we celebrate this, we know that you were right here with us, and we thank you for that. God, I ask that you would take this message and you use my voice as you see fit, but you allow each one of us to hear specifically what you have for us. And I just praise you and thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Need to know. Do you? Do you need to know? I think each one of us, if that doesn't apply to us, we can certainly think of someone that, I just got to know. And I, I have to know. But do you really? And if you say that, yes, you do, but why? Why do you need to know? And that can apply to a whole lot of things, but we're going to make it very specific uh, today as we go through this message on this first day of Advent with hope. Human life is about knowledge and understanding. We want to know the details. If someone doesn't give you all the information you want, you either leave frustrated or you, you interrupt and say, how about this? Fill in the blanks. Don't make me guess between the lines. We as humans want to know the details. The question is, do humans use the knowledge they have for good? If you answered yes, that's correct. If you answered no, that's also correct. Because as we think about things, and this just is, is kind of a high view of things, TNT was created with a very positive desire to do accomplish things. The internet was created for a very positive and, and wonderful environment. Amazingly enough, the loudspeaker was designed with a very positive approach. But in each one of these inventions, there has been a great deal of negative and ugly and awesome, you know, not positive by any means. We all know TNT has contributed very much to warfare and destruction. The internet, I'm just going to stop right there. You can take with that wherever you <laughs> can go with that. You know, the loudspeaker, I struggle with that one, but that's one that was used and is used in torture and interrogation, that this person is just blasted hour after hour after hour with this loud noise. So, not all knowledge is used for good. Where would the search of knowledge end, or where will it end? Knowledge. In 1995, knowledge doubled every 25 years. If you go back to like 1905, it was 100 years doubling. Today, it doubles every 12 hours. That's mind-boggling to me, but it is ever accelerating. The rate of knowledge doubling is ever going faster and faster. Now, I think of clear back, this was in the 80s. I was working uh, in, for a city and there was an older gentleman, and I, I suspect he was in his 80s at the time. And we were, I was picking up some debris from his yard, and we were talking, and this man lived alone, and so he wanted to engage anybody that would. And we got to talking about 
society and how things were going. And he looked at me and he says, young man, which at the time I was closer to that description than today, but he says, young man, I think the world is going faster than man can keep up. You know, and I've never forgotten his sincerity in saying that, and I believe he was right. And here we are today, 40 plus, 35, 40 years past that, and the world hasn't slowed down. You know, we're on the, the eve of the 1st of December, 2022. It goes fast. And this knowledge is just doubling and doubling. But here we go. We begin the Advent season this week, a time when we celebrate the incarnation of Jesus, his arrival into the life of every believer, and his anticipated second coming. Hence, hope. We have hope. What about Christ's second coming? Do you think on that? Do you reflect on it? Is it just something that you maybe hear once a year, twice a year? But do you anticipate and pray and look forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ? Do we hope to bear witness to the return of Christ at the end of the world? And for many, the answer is no. They don't live for that. Bearing witness to the return of Christ and the end of this world, that's not a conversation most people want to have. What do you think would happen if people knew the exact time of Christ's return? I want you to think about that. We're going to go back and we'll touch on that in a little bit. But what would happen if you knew And everyone knew. It was posted on every calendar made every year that this is the day he's coming back. Many seem to believe that Jesus' return will happen soon, but every prediction of when has been wrong. And it appears that everyone that has made those predictions, they've been wrong. It's failed. That's historic. We can document that. Advent season is a great time to get more clarity on what we need to know about Jesus' return. And that's the phrase, what we need to know. Today's text, and you heard it uh, read in the voice translation, which is a little more modern English, uh, but I want to read it uh, as we go through from the English Standard Version. And I want you, if you would, to put yourself and see if you fit in here anywhere. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. That's that's the first thing to remember. Only the Father knows. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of man. Well, if you go back and read The days of Noah, it wasn't a very pleasant place to be on this earth. There was a whole lot of negativity, a lot of evil. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. People were just living life as they knew how. That was what they did. And they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. And I think this last verse, verse 44, is kind of the key. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. 
It's not posted on a calendar. We don't know. In his humanity, Jesus did not know when he would return. As a human, he didn't, nor do we. Is it important for us to know? Think about that. Would it change how you live your life? Think about that. For the last 2,000 years since Christ's ascension, there was the knowledge because he said he would return. And every generation effectively was anticipating his return. What if you knew his return was 100 years from right now? Would it change how you live your life? You know, I, I, it may be a little bit of a poor analogy, but people that win the lottery will tell you, oh, it won't change my life. But it does. And in usually in most cases, it's not for good. In a matter of three years, most of them are bankrupt. So the knowledge didn't help in that world. If you knew that Jesus was not coming back till the year 21, 22, would you live your life differently? Would those around you live their life differently? Because if you were privy to the exact date, that means the world would be privy to the exact date. What would people be like? Would we even exist if 500 years ago they learned of the date? 2,000 years ago they knew of the date. Would society still be sustained? We do not need to know these things in order for us to do the most important thing. Follow Christ, worship and bear witness to him doesn't matter when he is coming back in a need-to-know basis. We know it's going to happen. He said so. We have the very hope of his return. But living our life should not matter when that occurs. Follow Christ, worship, and bear witness to him, to Jesus. That's the things that we're told that we should do. We learn three things from this passage in Matthew. Jesus assured his followers that he will return at some undetermined time after his ascension. So we don't have to question, is Christ coming back? We just know that it will happen because Jesus said so. And if Jesus is a liar, then nothing matters. But that's not the case. He said he's coming back, and we believe it. The second coming could happen at any time. You think about that. We don't know when that time is. We just know what's going to happen. His return could take time. Be prepared to persist in participating in his life and work. Is that our focus? That we focus on that following Christ, worshiping and bearing witness to him. Is that the premise that we live our Christian life as? The bottom line, live as if Jesus was coming today, but plan like he will not return in your lifetime. And that's, that's quite a wide dichotomy, to live as if Jesus was... Wouldn't that be awesome? We got up and we headed to church and... Jesus returned. We don't know when it'll be. We don't even know if it'll be in our lifetime. You know, there's there's another little twist on this for me. Do you know when you're going to die? Do you have a date picked out that is going to be this is your end of life on earth? No. Is it before Jesus comes back? Obviously, it would have to be before, because if he's already here, he's already risen in Christ. But those are the things we don't know. 
Does it change how we live our life? Jesus knows us. We struggle with ambiguity because we want to know. If God the Father had made that date known, personally, I don't think society would still be here. In this passage, Jesus also addresses two harmful ways of being. If people knew when Jesus would return, they would live self-centered lives. Living a self-indulgent lifestyle is mostly for show. And that, in that picture or that ideal, living that self-indulgent, self-centered lifestyle would all be just show. As that date approached, because they would know it was there, they would act Christian when the deadline approached. How many of you, no hands please, when you are seeking God in a very in, intentional, very well, asking for something, you're praying, you're, and you change your lifestyle just a little bit. You want to try and get more in line with God. Tell me no one has ever done that. It's human nature to, much like in school or in your workplace or within your family, you try and garner favor with those around you in a particular situation. Living that lifestyle, that's kind of the same thing. The self-indulgent show by their actions that they do not want to be citizens of the kingdom, and God will not force them to be otherwise. You don't have to be. That's your choice. God's not going to force it, but it's your choice. The self-righteous would be tempted to disengage from the world. In their mind... The world would be destroyed soon, so why bother dealing with anyone who is not saved? You don't fit my criteria. I don't want to take the time for you. Think about all of that ramification. All comes into play from a premise of, I need to know. We need to know. The self-righteous do not obey Christ's imperative to love our fellow humans and make sacrifices for their well-being. We look and see other people that maybe not look like us, act like us, talk like us, and we don't want to associate or engage those people because why? Are they going to rub off on us? Or... Do we feel it's a waste of time? Who did Jesus talk with and, and eat with and spend time with when he was on earth? The marginalized, those that couldn't do anything for themselves anyway. He reached out to them. Christians are sent by Christ into this world. That's what we are tasked to do. We are sent by Jesus into this world. Loving our neighbors and bearing witness to the reality of Jesus are not optional activities for believers. Where does that leave us? What does that leave us with? Staying home, reading our Bible, praying, which are not bad things. Coming to church once a week which is also not a bad thing. But is that the extent of what we're supposed to do? Loving our neighbors. And we've talked a lot about that over the last few months. Do you know your neighbors? Do you engage your neighbors? I have, and you've heard me mention, a neighbor that she's 
88. Gave her car up this year because she knew she wasn't safe to drive. And she's all the time doing little things for those in, that, in the elderly housing that she lives in across the street from me. You see her with her walker going from one unit to the next, and she's engaging. She's, she's sharing life on life. And for whatever reason, we've adopted her and she's adopted us, and it is the most wonderful relationship for this woman. She watches our house better than any security system I could ever get. And I say that, I normally keep a light on above our garage outside, so the, it's just lit, it's an LED, it burns all night. Tuesday evening, I get this text, Kirk, your outside light is off. <laughs> Okay, and I just chuckled, I just because to me it was humorous, but it was, she cared, and it meant a lot to me. I sent back thanks, and went over and turned the light switch on, and all was normal again. Her name is Norma, so it was all normal again. But I told her that I knew she couldn't go where we were going to be at for Thanksgiving because of a number of steps. And I said, I want to bring you some food. Oh, you don't have to. But it was so much fun to take a couple of plates of food over and give to her and just share life. Loving our neighbors, that may not be the way we all do that. It may be that you watch somebody's house while they're out of town. It may be that you engage or take care of something for their neighbor. Are you over there preaching Jesus to your neighbor when you do that? Not overtly, but in a, in a way of love. Isn't that what Christ is telling us to do? When he says, love your neighbors, what is that? That's reaching out to them and helping them. When they may have a need that you can have answer, how awesome is it to do that? These are not optional activities. Getting to know our neighbors. For us here in this congregation, engaging in the local elementary, as was prayed for in the intercessory prayer, loving on those people there. I have to tell you, last Tuesday when we did uh, a celebration and provided food and snacks and uh, drinks in the teacher's lounge. Repeatedly throughout the day, as I was in checking, thank you, thank you. You guys are so awesome. It's not us. It was Jesus. Did I tell them it was Jesus? No. They, they were thinking the only thing they saw there were some that I know, because they ask, are you from, from the church? That, Yeah, I'm, we're from the church. Left it alone. They appreciated. And it was a way to love and appreciate them. Working with the little kids, it's the same thing. When you have, and there was a, one little girl, I think she's a kindergarten, but I can be standing there and all of a sudden I'll feel something on my leg and this little girl has come up to give me a hug and it's such a joy there's nothing it's pure innocence of appreciation and I think any one of us would appreciate when we get that kind of response in any circumstance we should live as if Christ was coming today but plan for his arrival is far in the future. When I say that, I also think we live for Christ as if he was coming today because none of us are promised tomorrow. Scripture also says that. Oh, I'll do it next month. I'll be a part of, of doing something with my neighborhood this summer. 
Maybe you will, and maybe you won't. Plan as if Christ was returning today, but make your life living his example forever. Like Christ was coming today means that we strive to take advantage of every opportunity to increase our intimacy with him. When you think about that, that can be. Do you know how awesome he is when he sees his children loving and appreciating one another? You've seen it with your family when they, everyone gets along. Hopefully, many of you experienced it last Thursday when you could share a meal and not argue. No one went away mad. You just enjoyed the family. Or maybe it was just a group of friends. Believers bear witness to the king by offering our neighbors opportunities to experience the kingdom with us. Does that mean that we beat our neighbors up with a Bible or or their attitudes or their approach? No. We represent Jesus to all those around us. We are not told the timing or the precise circumstances of Christ's return because that information does not change anything about Christians of what they're supposed to be doing. Knowing the date should not make a difference. Living a Christian life should be the same with or without that knowledge. The knowledge that counts is it's going to happen. That's all we really need to know about what Christians are to be doing. There's hope in all of that. Isn't it exciting when maybe you have someone that they're just this tough nut to crack? You you know, you say hi, you do things nice, and they just don't respond. I'm sure that none of you have experienced that, but there's a few that have. But boy, when they finally do respond, even in the littlest things, doesn't that warm your heart? Isn't that a thank you, Jesus moment? Because you know who softened that heart. Those who sincerely strive to love God and love others need feel nothing but excitement at Christ's second coming. Do you feel excitement when you think about the coming of Jesus the second time? Doesn't that kind of get you, oh, what's that going to be like? All of these problems are going to go away, but what is coming with Jesus? He's going to usher in his kingdom. I can't picture how awesome that's going to be. But I will tell you, I pray daily for Jesus' second coming as I see so many events happening. I drive through regions of our city that have many without a home that are sleeping on the ground. In Derby, talking with the police department, There are five that they've identified that live here. You say, well, that's not very many. If you're that one, that's a lot. And they, the officer that I talked with, has made it her goal to engage and help and find ways to help these individuals. It's not going to get better in this world, in this society. That five in a few years could be 10, could be 20. I don't know. But what will fix that is Jesus coming again. 
and we can make a long list of the changes that we can look forward to seeing, and it won't touch what the changes Jesus will bring. That's how awesome his being and his coming will be. We have nothing to fear because it is Jesus who is coming. It's not an unknown. It's not an entity or a ruling party that we're not familiar with who doesn't have our best interest in his heart. It's Jesus coming. Come, Lord Jesus, come. And I hope that that phrase sticks in your mind, in your heart, as you see events, as you experience joys. This little girl grabbing my leg and hugging Jesus has to enjoy that. He put that in the heart of humans to share. Come, Lord Jesus, come. As we look to the communion table, and I will mention from the very beginning, we have a very uh, open table. It's an open communion. There are no stipulations. It's your choice wide open. And as we come to the table, do you have hope that stems from the elements on this table? The broken body of Christ in the form of the bread, his spilled blood in the form of the fruit of the vine. Is there hope within those elements for you? There is. He willingly sacrificed himself. He could have came down. I mean, everyone around him, the the Roman soldiers, the ruling party of the Jews were taunting him to come down. Save yourself. And then we would have nothing. And he knew that. So the elements at the table, to me, have a great deal of hope on this first day of Advent. As you come forward As I mentioned so often, think about the impact of these elements for you. If you would care to join me in prayer, please. Loving Father, thank you for Jesus and the Holy Spirit that teaches us, that brings things to mind, that gives us hope. For the elements here at the table, I do ask that you would bless them, that you would help each one of us to reflect on our lives, to live today as if Jesus is coming today, but planning for the future. And the future gives us opportunity to live and serve in Welcome our neighbors, our families, our friends. God, as we ingest this communion meal, you touch our hearts, God. I thank you and I praise you for Jesus. And it's in his name, say amen.